Hi guys, hope you're having a great day so far. Well, now that the, the, uh, the large majority of us are at home with the kids, you may be looking for some fresh ideas to help the kids um, educated, keeping their little hearts and minds sort of ticking over. Um, one great topic, of course, um, of conversation to keep the kids busy, of course, is food. And this is something that all parents can educate their, their kids on, no matter no matter what the age or the education level. So lucky for us today, uh, we're joined by our very special guest, Alicia Edge, and more famously known as the dietitian to the Matildas, Australia's national football or soccer team. Now, Alicia mm -hmm. is a mother of three kids under five and an advanced sports dietitian uh, with a focus on high performance and general well-being. Um, she uses her extensive knowledge to help others, um, with, whether it be from baby-led uh, feeding, um, everyday wellness, or high-performance athleticism with teams like the Matildas. We're really thrilled to have you today, Alicia. How are you doing? I'm really well, thanks Rachel. Thank you so much for having me in these crazy, crazy times. I know, I know. And I think everyone at the moment is just, well, we've heard the phrase a million times during unprecedented times, but it really is. Mm. And like we're just saying- yeah, it's not an exaggeration this time, is it? Yeah. <laughs> it's just almost like a really bad film. Like we're all just like dreaming at the moment and you just want to wake up and yeah. just say, that was, that was, it was really crap, you know, <laughs> and just give yeah. that back. But unfortunately, this is just, um, this is our reality. But um, yeah, really it's... sorry, go. <laughs> No, no, all good. I think it's just real. Yeah, I, I'm just feeling for everyone at the moment, we're, whether you are, you know, struggling financially to get that um, security down, but also everyone with kids at home and trying to find their way in their new way for who knows how long. And I think it's that uncertainty about time that's really hard. Uh, and I, I've had some really big discussions with our athletes about it this week, about, you know, trying to refine purpose, trying to find a gift in all of this. Um, there has to be some positives that we can find. It, it can be sometimes too early to hear that. You might not be ready to hear that, but hopefully over time we can see some real things that we can work on with our kids, with our family, uh, and get to a point where we're feeling really grateful for um, that next chapter once it happens. Yeah, and that's just the thing is just, this is only just gonna be for a certain amount of time. How we use this time to the best of our abilities um, and stay as positive as we can to be able to push our way through because everyone's in the same scenario at the moment. Uh, this is how we use this time and survival of the fittest, I think, in, in, within our minds, mm. definitely. And I'd love to be able to pick your brain today on some um, in, inspirational topics around food um, that- yeah can be having with um, and some conversations that parents can be having with their kids uh, whilst at home in, in isolation. Now, to begin with, um, we published your article and the title of it is, what are nutrients, uh, what do they do, and how, do your, your, how to answer your kids' why questions about food. So for someone mm. who hasn't read the article, can you give us a little bit of an overview of what it's about and uh, just what inspired you to write it? Mm. I think as mums, we tend to um, panic a little bit when it comes to knowing what to feed our kids and also making sure that they're getting everything they need. Uh, and so the more we know about food and the more kind of uh, little bricks that we know about how it builds up into what our overall diet should be, hopefully the more empowered we feel. So um, the main reason we wanted to write about nutrients wasn't to kind of make it all sciencey and overwhelming, but rather translate it into how you actually eat and that's through food um, and so a big message hopefully that came through the article is that we don't eat nutrients we eat food and so even when we're talking about high carbohydrate foods even something like rice actually contains protein and so then moving through these things and also knowing how nutrients help our body we can then open this new conversation and this new curiosity with our kids yeah well, let's get stuck into these questions. The question number one we've got for you, we've got a few of them, but really, really excited to start. Question I love how organised you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Question number one, what are some of the key nutrients our bodies need and where are they found? Yeah. Uh, so when we're talking nutrients, there's two main types that we talk about, and you may have heard these in different places. So the big um, chunk nutrients that we call are our macronutrients. So macro means big, and you can kind of think about them like that umbrella. So we've yep. got carbohydrates, proteins, fats, 
and alcohol. So for you guys playing at home, you'll be talking about alcohol, but hopefully with the kids where it's not a conversation we're having a lot. Um, but yeah, they're your macronutrients. Um, so there's four of them, but usually we're talking about the three. And then under that umbrella are all what we call our micronutrients. So our micronutrients or small are things like our minerals and our vitamins. And so they're coming from all different types of foods and every food has a different type of an amount of micronutrients. So um, they're things like our minerals, like sodium, magnesium, things that you would have talked or thought about there. And then our vitamins, there's two types. There's fat soluble and there's water soluble. So fat soluble are your A, D, E and K. And fat soluble, we want to know about because we can actually store fat soluble. So in our fat stores and with um, eating fat, we can actually help to absorb fat soluble vitamins and also um, help us get through. So for example, vitamin D, we get most of that over summer when we're in the sun and getting sunlight. And we can actually store that over the winter months. So if our vitamin D stores are low in summer, we're going to struggle through winter. Um, so that's um, the type of thing we're talking about there. Water soluble are, vit are vitamins like your B vitamins. Um, and you might think about those if you take a multivitamin, it go your wee turns really yellow. Yep. And water soluble, that happens because you're weeing out anything you don't need. It flushes out. Um, yeah, you don't absorb excess if you like. So if you're going to take a multivitamin, um, and you don't need it, you're going to wee a lot out. So you have expensive wee <laughs> is probably the easiest yeah. way to put that. Uh, and there's no risk of overdoing it um, because you do wee it out, whereas you can overdo the fat-soluble ones. So it's really important we don't um, supplement with A, D, E, and K unless we need to. Right. Um, so that's kind of the easy way to um, explain those. And then um, they're like we, get, we can really delve down into more, but they're our big ones that we need to worry about. And really... Um, in terms of getting those, uh, they're through a whole range of foods. Yeah. And so at the moment, we've spoken about macro and micronutrients. Mm. There's lots of other stuff yeah. in the article sort of covers. Um, now, high-performance athleticism like the Matildas really requires um, a lot of high-level research nutrient mm. groups um, to keep their, their bodies fit and strong. Um, so yeah. look, what, what lessons can parents learn from this um, mm. a strong focus on their diet for their family during yeah. this like, coronavirus pandemic. What can they, what can they learn mm. from, from all of this stuff? Yeah, well, one of the biggest things we um, always talk about with our clients, because our clients, even though we're performance nutrition, we work from um, with anyone like a new mum all the way up to our pro athletes. And the reason for that is, is that performance translates so the definition of performance will be different for each person so if i ask you rachel what performance means to you you might say oh i want to have more energy or i want to be more confident or i want to um you know aim for health or whatever it may be yep. and then if i ask an elite pro athlete not saying you're not rachel not saying you're not a pro athlete <laughs> i'm an elite pro athlete of a keyboard and a mouse. oh yeah yeah exactly yeah yeah see well, that's another thing, right? So, um, so also another thing when we're talking to people who work in a desk, it might be that, oh, well, performance to me means concentration and focus and productivity. So that's lots of things we work on with um, people in the workplace and then also um, new mums as they're kind of getting out and they're into the depths of sleep deprivation. Then when we're talking to a pro athlete, their response to performance is like, I want to get a PB, I want to win, I want to, you know, I want to have my best power. And, you know, you're talking a lot about weight and power to weight and um, strength and performance in the piece of the sport. So when we're thinking about Matildas, we translate that really quickly to the family life. And it might sound like a really big stretch, but um, what we focus on first, no matter who you are, is that base level of nutrition. So we're talking about things like um, those big rocks. So how colourful is your plate? How much variety is in that? What's the quality of your protein like? Are you getting enough carbohydrates in for how much you're moving and how much you need to grow? Um, so all these things translate to the home in the way that, okay, well, how much colour are we getting on our plates day to day? How much variety are we are managing there? Do your kids only eat, you know, brown foods or do your kids not touch um, a certain colour of food? And those types of things are like, okay, we need to increase variety or quality or whatever it may be. 
And then we're talking about protein. So protein are like your building blocks for muscle development and recovery, but they're also really important in times of growth. So our kitties, um, they need a lot less protein than what you might think. Uh, I think the normalization of protein supplements and things is something we could talk about all day, but they're not something your kids need because um, we get a lot of protein through our food. Uh, and then we're also talking about carbohydrates. So the more we move and the more we run and the more we jump or whatever it may be, the more carbohydrates we need. So um, as our kids move a lot more than a lot of us, their need for carbohydrate is actually higher than it is for um, the person who sits at the desk all day, like me. <laughs> um, and Rachel. So um, when we're just sitting and our, our heart rate isn't very high, we're kind of just very sedentary, um, we don't all need all that much carbohydrate. We've got enough going through our bloodstream from what we've eaten. But as we start running or dive into the swimming pool or go for a bike ride and all these things we're all dreaming of doing now that we're stuck at home, um, <laughs> we do need more carbohydrate to fuel that activity. And so all these things that we're using for our athletes are then translated into the home for our kitties. So there, that's the really big piece there. And there's no one way or no one right way. Um, we really value everyone's different um, beliefs around food. Uh, yeah. their preferences around food and so there's no um, set way to eat but rather just a progress that you can aim for yeah and look mm. you know parents may be focused feeding their family like a healthier diet during this time given <laughs> a their home yeah they've got more time mm. to be cooking a, a full like a full meal yeah. like they're rushing home from work and everything else <laughs> and b i guess they're really probably more focused on providing a greater nutritional quality um like to mm. strengthen their family's immune system. So yeah. in yeah. doing this, I guess I'm guessing this may actually expose children to veggies and foods maybe that they're not used to as well, potentially mm. as well, seeing more vegetables on the plate. Um, so yeah. in saying that, how do you suggest that we make um, food fun and educate educational for young eaters mm -hmm. at this time then? Yeah, I, I think you just highlighted a real silver lining of this whole situation. So all of a sudden we've got time to work on things that we may have wished we had previously um, and now we suddenly do. So how do we maximise that opportunity? So um, one thing that we um, know is that uh, the parent um, showing kids and being there for kids to show normalisation around eating different foods is number one yep. both the mum and dad are really important in that situation if you're both at home um, as much as possible uh, and so that way you talk about foods um, and the way that you accept foods and don't necessarily speak up about oh I don't like that or mummy doesn't like that or daddy doesn't like that food we need to remove that conversation and instead talk a little bit differently about accepting different foods and um, really striving for curiosity um, one thing that we see a lot of is that, oh, my kids don't like veggies, so I'm just going to blitz them up and hide them. Yep. And that, that's, that's a really good strategy, but remembering you want to normalise veggies as well. Yep. So what we say is if you're going to blitz up veggies and hide them, we also want to show veggies as well. So do both. Yep. Um, and one, one thing that that does is, number one, it makes you relaxed as a parent because you're like, hey, hey, they're having their veggies and they yep. don't know. And so I'm going to be more relaxed at the table. And then the other side of that is they're going to feel that relaxation and actually feel a little bit more comfortable in exploring. Yeah. And so, for example, that might look like, say, a bolognese filled with lots of veggies that they can't see. And yep. you might put mushroom or chopped carrot or something like that through it. So they're still seeing chunks of veggies, but there's lots of hidden. Yep. Uh, it might be that there's lots of hidden veggies in a certain like wet dish. And then there's a side of steamed veggies or salad on the plate that they can nibble. So there's different ways to do it. But what you're wanting to do is normalize veg vegetables, make, it, make them realize that there's something to enjoy and explore rather than something that they have to eat. And yes. that probably leads us into that why question, right? <laughs> No, and I was just about to yeah. ask, when parents ask yeah. question, why about foods, mm -hmm. like why do I have to eat this and what, what is this and why, yeah. how are they better yeah. to answer that when the kids are asking that question? Mm. Uh, I think the, the nicest thing about kids is their curiosity. And even though it gets so tiring, the why question, oh my word, my two-year-old at the moment is like, why? 
life. And I was like, oh, this is never ending. There is no right answer here. <laughs> um, the more we can play with that and actually embrace it, the better. Yeah. Uh, it opens up a lot of um, opportunities there to talk, not only of like, oh, well, it's just good for us or it's a healthy food. Instead, flipping that and actually talking about it as food is food. Yes. Um, one thing I think we tend to do as parents, and that's really because we were taught that and diet culture has taught us that there's good and bad foods. There's a morality around foods. What we want to do is remove that. And that's a topic for a totally different conversation, Rachel, because it's a big one. Yes. Uh, and instead, talk about food as all equal. It's just that um, our different roles change. So... I don't know if it's something that you've covered in other um, videos, but there's this responsibility that you as the parent decide what they eat and when, yep. and the kids decide if um, they actually eat it <laughs> and how much they eat. Yep. And so when you've, when you've taken over that role, you can then start to go let them play and actually talk about what they're going to do. So they want to know why. They want to know that, you know, is it going to increase their muscles? Is it going to make them stronger? Is it going to help them see? Um, all these types of things that are going like, oh, my goodness. So my son eats a piece of broccoli and he shows me his muscles as he's doing I'm not going to show you my muscles because they're weak as at the moment. And then <laughs> no flex here. And then um, he'll be like, oh, no, this arm's not needing another one. So he'll, like, have to have two broccoli to make sure they're even. <laughs> yeah yeah um and he'll really tell his sister he'll be like oh Florence your your muscles are not good because you didn't eat them today so oh, it's like oh. this game that's passed down and if anyone can make their oldest child a good eater it really helps that peer pressure as the other kids come through yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, oh sorry you gotta continue continue yeah no you're right you're right no, I was just going to say, because our audience really um, in saying that in different ages, like mm. we've got a broad mm. audience um, with yeah. regards to the, the ages of the children. So we'd love for you mm. to maybe just like break down per age group, what parents yeah. uh, could uh, be talking to their kids about um, and starting with preschoolers. Yeah. So I know that the, the article yeah. covers some really great information, but if we were to really sort mm. of, you know, sort of, you know, make it quite sort of easy for, for, for parents, what, yeah. what should they be talking about to their preschoolers? Yeah, I love that. So around that one or two year old age, you're really just talking about real basics that they're kind of learning um, at the same time anyway. Things like colour and texture, yep. Yep. Um, hot or cold, uh, float or sink is a really fun game. So I know people say don't play at the table, but there's a there's a, a boundary there that you can really work towards. So kids won't necessarily just eat a new food that it'll be a rare case if they feel comfortable enough just to scoff it in. They'll do a lot of exploring first. And even our seven month old, if you watch her with a new food, she'll like bang it a bit, squish it a bit, touch it to her lips a bit before she feels ready to actually eat it. <clears throat> and so that exploration continues. So even if your child doesn't eat a new food, you can still really get them to explore what color is it? Um, is it squishy or crunchy? And you know, they actually do that and then taste it. <laughs> Suckers. <laughs> um, and you can have crunch competitions, you know, so everyone can get their carrot or their things and um, see who can crunch the loudest carrot. Um, you can look at um, getting a bowl of water and seeing which one floats, which one sinks. Why is that? You know, um, all these types of conversations from that one to two year old age are perfect. And still our four year old loves it as well. Yeah. Um, as they get a bit older, you can start to oh, then really... Yeah. What was that? Sorry. Yeah, what would you say for about primary school age kids? What would you yeah, say? yeah. As they get older, you can really start to bring in the um, body side of things. So um, what it does, what, what, what it helps with, why we need it, but not just, oh, it's good for us. It's really like, oh, this has a really cool purpose. Yeah. Um, and even fun things like matching. Well, if we team this with that, we can actually absorb oh, more of the nutrients and, you know, that sciency and the math side of things. Also getting them involved in the kitchen has the maths aspect. So we've got um, cut measuring, counting, all those side sort of things bringing into it. And one thing that our child loves is knowing how it's made or how it's grown. Oh, so, wow. yeah, so those types of things are really nice of like, okay, well, where's that grown? Is that a tree? Is it underground? Um, can I watch a YouTube clip on how that's made? Um, you know, those sort of things is really, really cool because, you know, gone are the days that we make everything. Um, but if they can understand those processes and be curious about it, they're more likely to go, oh, I want to try that. Or can we cook with it? 
uh, and getting them involved in as many processes as possible now that you're at home is a really cool thing so obviously you know food availability is a bit tough at the moment it'll it'll flatten out promise you australia has not run out of food yeah. uh it's just that they have struggled to restock in time so your food availability will be short-term problem um it'll come back and so once it is back and you've got you know a, a well-stocked kitchen if you have missed out on stuff there's a lot of exploring to be done and um, a lot of fun to all sit down at the table, all chat around this and make it a really um, fun experience because kids are really sensitive to how you feel. So if you're sitting down frantic and frustrated and why don't you eat and it's a fight before you even sit down, they're going to really work towards, you know, really fighting back before you've even started as well. Yeah. So the more that you can not react and the more you can be quite fun um, and relaxed and really have that um, response of, you know, say last night, my um, two year old, we made pizzas, we did all the right things, we made them together, and she still was like, I don't want this. It was, it would be so easy to go, oh, I made this nice dinner, I can't believe you don't like it, you will eat this dinner um, because we're tired and we're like, just eat the body dinner yeah. but instead if you can take a step back and go, okay, what's she feeling? Why isn't she wanting this? And really then talk through really calmly, you know, that's okay. There's no stress on eating this. There's no pressure around any of this, but this is the only thing we've got for dinner. And so you can explore, you can sit with us. And then if you're not happy that, you know, like you can explore past that, but it's really about making sure that they know that this is dinner and making sure they've got a safe food um, so that they do feel ready to explore. And they know that at least one food on their plate is something they enjoy. And that's where I stuffed up, by the way. So I didn't put a safe food on the plate. I put pizza, which she usually likes, but I wasn't 100% sure she would like it that night. But if I put pizza plus some safe food, say um, some grapes or some strawberries or something like that, that I know she will always love, it would have been a much different conversation. Yeah, that's a really, really interesting point there to mm -hmm. be able to always have yeah. safe food food on the plate that they know yeah of. it's probably another one for another um video yeah yeah it's a big one yeah 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 um and just um just getting back to the article so basically everything in there mm. I could you could speak to your your, your secondary um uh, sort of age yeah. children i think which is great mm. so we've covered off on the preschool the primary school and the secondary but with yeah. this now what activities can parents be doing at home to demonstrate these lessons because you've got some great mm. great tips in the um in the mm. in the article Mm. Uh, parents being involved um, and showing their enjoyment of food and their relationship with food is a really big one. Um, one thing that we work on first is the parents' relationship with food. Um, so if you're always talking about a food being fattening or bad or something we can't have, then the kids are going to reflect that very quickly. They, they absorb it very quickly. So one reason we don't necessarily go straight to the kids sometimes when we're working with you, we go to the parent um, because once the parent is feeling more confident and they have a much more positive relationship with food, that flows onto the kids so, so quickly. And it's this beautiful thing that we watch. So um, that's number one, um, is really reflecting on your own relationship with food with curiosity, not judgment. That is a really big thing that we push. So if you do find yourself, you know, saying something, it's okay to go, whoa, what was that? And where'd that come from? I need to take stock, not necessarily stress about it, but just explore it and be curious about where you can go from there. Um, other things you can be doing is, you know, the cooking side of things, preparing. Um, when kids prepare and cook, you know, they are more likely to eat it, but it's not a guarantee that, like, as you said last night, like, pizza didn't work. Um, <laughs> but it is nice and it does explore and it does teach and it, it is a really nice time filler too. <laughs> Um, and then additional to that, um, at the table, sitting as a family as much as possible. It's not always possible, but it might be more possible at the moment, which is really, really nice. So um, the more that you can display um, uh, food eating together, the more you can chat about foods together, the more that they can see you eating different foods, um, the more progress you will make. And, you know, you're sitting with them and encouraging them and keeping them feeling safe Whereas if you're giving the kids food and then walking away and doing something else, they're kind of sitting there going, I've got all this food, I don't know what it is, and I have no one around me to actually reassure me about this. So it's like tantrum time, or they're feeling really tired at that time as well. So by sitting with them and making it a family thing, it does definitely help and just bring you into a place of being ready to make progress. Yeah. 
And at the bottom of the article, you, you also um, mm. highlight some um, some main takeaways to not not number takeaway foods, but lessons. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> to, yeah. <laughs> to maximise um, nutrients overall. Um, yeah, I, I've got the article in front of me. I can sort of start to sort of just quickly read through them and, and to tell me um, what your thoughts are. If there's anything else, yeah, go want. for it. So the first one is mix it up by serving some raw and some cooked foods mm. simultaneously. Um, yeah. So that, that's a really great point. Um, the second one, repurpose the juice and fluids left over from cooking meats and veggies. Tell us a little bit about mm. that. Yeah, so when you're cooking different foods, there is this um, change in their nutrients. So mainly we're talking about our micronutrients here. So um, for example, when we cook um, some veggies in water, particularly ones high in water soluble vitamins, a lot of those vitamins will go into the water. Uh, and they'll be lost and also they're very sensitive to heat like vitamin C will be um, reduced in heat and so if we can actually utilize that water again it's a really big nutrient source so things like making um, stocks out of it or soups um, can actually be something really really cool that you can do and same with meat so B vitamins is a water soluble vitamin that I mentioned earlier and they're high in meats so things like your B12 is something you've probably heard of and that's high in meat but because it's water soluble, when you lose the juices of the um, meat, you lose a lot of that as well. Not all of it, you still get lots from the meat, um, but uh, if you can put the juices into different um, sauces or gravies, then it can actually um, be somewhere that you end up getting more nutrients than you realize. So that's where that um, different variety in cooking methods is really important. Um, not boiling veggies too much is a really big one because you will lose a lot of nutrients. So things like microwave or steaming are all um, much better opportunities there uh, and repurposing the fluids. So you're um, getting in those water soluble vitamins where you can as well. Yeah. And another point you mentioned also is to keep the peel on the veggies where possible. Yeah. So stuff like jacket potatoes. Tell us a little bit yeah. about that too. Yeah, so um, when we're talking about the skin of veggies, a lot of the um, fiber is in that, but a lot of the nutrients are in it as well. It's a very um, nutrient dense source. So um, if you can even cook veggies with the skin on and then take it off, you're still going to get some benefit there. Um, kids won't always eat the skin, but um, I always say like, start the way you want to finish. So um, do the skin and then they'll decide over time that it's normal and start to eat it eventually. Um, it's like my current war on um, baby spinach. I'll just keep putting it on their plate. <laughs> and, and the other day they actually ate it. So after yeah. years of having one or two spinach leaves, we got there. Yeah, yeah. So it was really funny how it just was this very long thing and we never talked about not liking baby spinach. It was like, you don't like it yet. You will, you will one day. So we're just going to keep it there. And when your taste buds are ready, we just, yeah, they'll know. So yeah, it was this really funny long process and we finally got there. Um, so that's another thing about the skin. So anything from fruit and veggies, try and keep the skin on, but you know, there's no pressure in that of always doing it, but it is a nice way to keep in some nutrients. Now you've really given us some really practical ideas uh, and simple ideas to help families, um, you know, teaching their kids about food um, and yeah. especially sort of around meal times and everything else. Is there anything else, any other key points you'd love to be able to, to communicate to them outside of what's in the article and or just to paraphrase, to summarise everything that we've just sort of spoken about? Is there any sort of key yeah, yeah. points you'd love to be able to sort of to get out there? I could, um, yeah, I could talk a long time about food and kids, as you can probably tell. Um, so I think there's a few topics that we've kind of brushed over today that we'll probably have to delve into a little bit deeper, Rachel, at some stage. Um, so that's when we're, I guess the biggest thing, and it's something that we put on our um, kids' Instagram page the other day, uh, was really making sure that it's not about good or bad and it's not about doing 110 percent this type of diet or this type of food it's about that positive relationship with food and if you can aim for a relaxed positive relationship with food for your kids and your family and really just aim for that progress yep. you will be doing so so well i think as parents we always think the worst and we're always our worst enemy when it comes to i'm never doing enough my kids aren't eating enough i should be doing better you are doing an incredible job and the best job you can. It's now going, okay, I've got a little bit of extra time or a little bit of opportunity now. What can I do better? And it may just be one or two different little things. Don't try and change everything all at once. Just change one or two things that you feel really confident in trying to um, focus on and go from there and just keep building from there. Because, um, yeah, it's 
very tough job, but um, yeah, if you can go in feeling a little bit relaxed and confident, um, it would go a really long way. Yeah. Well, look, Alicia, I've absolutely loved chatting with you today and I'm really looking forward to some other chats in, in the, um, the yeah. near future. If parents have got any other questions for you, whereabouts can they find you? <laughs> Yeah, so we've got two Instagram pages. So Compete Nutrition is like the adult performance nutrition piece. That's where the sports nutrition and performance nutrition lie. And we've got an online dashboard where you can get all online support there. We do work with development athletes um, in terms of the child space. Um, and it's all done via our dashboard and you can chat to us there anytime. Uh, we've also got free assessments on our website. If you were like, oh, I would love more energy or I'd love um, more concentration, then do a free assessment and I will get back to you in person to tell you how to get started uh, and a few little um, tips and tricks you can do. Our other little passion project is um, an Instagram page called baby underscore led underscore feeding. So um, we are changing the name because it's obviously evolved a lot since we first started with a four and a half year old now. Um, so we talk about all things baby nutrition all the way up to toddler and um, getting them involved in the kitchen and their relationship with food. So um, if you've got questions, we always have our PM boxes very full. Uh, we try and give out as much information as we can um, and it's done with another dietitian Karen so both of us have little ones and are more than happy to answer your questions there as well awesome and we'll make sure we've got all those links at the bottom of the introduction paragraph Alicia thank, thank you so you. much for your time can't wait to chat with You're you well. again soon give my love to the kids oh thank you see ya bye <laughs> see you Rachel